Well, I'd first like to acknowledge that this session is brought to us by Bow Screen Australia, and we have Honorary Professor Peter Carroll, who is uh, an Honorary Professor in Pharmacology at the University of Sydney and Northern Clinical School Royal North Shore Hospital. Um, Professor Carroll has worked in hospital and academic pharmacy for the past 30 years and is a regular contributor to continuing professional education activities for pharmacists in Australia and overseas. So I will ask Professor Carroll to come up to talk to you about screening as a professional health service. Thank you. Thank you for that and uh, thank you all for coming uh, this morning. What I'm going to talk about is colorectal cancer, although people refer to it as bowel cancer. So if I say bowel cancer, I mean colorectal cancer and vice versa. And why would I want to talk about colorectal cancer? And why do I believe, and I do seriously believe this, that there's a major opportunity for pharmacy to be involved in public health initiatives helping to reduce the toll? of this particular cancer. This, I think, is a very telling slide. A lot of us mightn't realise, till you see this slide, colorectal cancer is the second most common cancer in Australia. It is the second most common cause of cancer-related deaths. Talk to people, they think breast cancer. They think prostate cancer. Colorectal cancer kills more Australians than breast cancer and prostate cancer. Without being facetious, you can say it's an equal opportunity disease. It affects both males and females. No one is, uh, is a bit, uh, immune from this. Just a couple of statistics. One in 12 of us will get it, 14,000 each year. And if, I, if you don't know this, it's a serious statistic. Every two hours, someone dies in this country from colorectal cancer, right? Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, etc., etc. So it does kill quite a few of us. So what I, I thought I'd also talk a little bit about risk factors, and I'll talk a little bit about what the disease is, because if we're going to talk to patients and counsel patients, it's important to have a good background knowledge of what we're actually talking about. The major risk. I'm sorry. The major risk of colorectal cancer is getting old, right? I'm sorry about that. Uh, if you get to 40, your risk starts to increase. When you get to 50, and you don't need to be too bright to see that I'm over 50, uh, up goes the risk. I don't want to be unkind, but this, it's a pretty young audience. But I see a few people around here who may be over uh, getting to that uh, uh, age. We are more at risk. People talk about family history. There is a bit of family history, but really, if, you, if you've got a close relative that had uh, bowel cancer, colorectal cancer, you have a, an increased risk, albeit not all that large. But most cases, there's no family history. It just comes out of the blue on people. People have probably heard of polyps. Polyps grow in the colon and in the rectum not in everyone, but they do grow. Some people grow more than others. Um, some are benign, but most colorectal cancer, most bowel cancer develops from polyps. And polyps are little mushrooms. They have, this is not the best picture in the world, but they're on a stalk. And there's tissue on the top, and that is the precursor to the colorectal cancer in, in most people. So if you have a history of polyps, you're more at risk, and are certain disease states, you're more at risk. But everyone over the age of 50 potentially uh, is at risk of this disease. I thought also, if we're going to counsel patients, it's a good idea just to know what we're talking about. And here's just a diagram of the gut. Sorry I'm pointing at this one because it's closer to me. I'll be fair and put it over here too. Um, most people think of the colon and the rectum being right down here, right? That's not true. If you look at, this is my right side, and you get your right side, the ascending colon, I'm good at this, aren't I? Uh, the ascending colon runs right up here. The transverse colon's across here, where you're just next to your stomach. Often when you feel your stomach rumbling, it's actually your transverse colon 
that's there. So it runs up and then runs down the descending colon into the sigmoid colon into the rectum. So it's quite a large tube that goes down like that. Uh, where do the cancers occur? And again, this is just for information if you like to talk to people about it. Most of the cancers, over 50%, are down in the sigmoid colon and the rectum. So they are down here on the, the left side. But they can certainly occur anywhere in that um, particular tube. I'll let these guys come in. Sorry guys, I, we were going to wait but they made me start. Interestingly also, this is where polyps are. You get far more polyps in this descending colon and the sigmoid colon than in the rest of it. That's a crash course in anatomy and colorectal cancer. Very important point. Early colorectal cancer has no symptoms. You don't know you've got it. Okay, I could be standing here with it. You don't know you've got it. Fewer than 40% of cancers in this country are detected early. And I'm going to show you the next couple of slides how important that is. Because if you get it early, it's well over 90% curable, right? Screening tests, and you'll hear me say this many times, are crucial to beating this disease and getting better health outcomes. It's a pretty picture, isn't it? It's a good picture. That's colorectal cancer. It's called 1, 2, 3 and 4 or A, B, C and D. It's staged. Phase, stage naught showing here just means it's a precancerous polyp that hasn't really done its thing yet, and that's a seriously good time to get it. Stage one is just in the bowel wall or the rectum colon wall, it's still there. This is where you come unstuck. Once the cancer's developing more, it gets into the lymph glands. And once it's in the lymph glands, you start to get serious problems. Because what it'll do, it'll end up in the lung it'll end up in the liver. You do not die of the cancer that's in your gut. You die because of the spread, the metastases and the secondary tumours. Have a look at this. If you screen for people, and I'm talking about us all, get it here, in, you've got a, much, a greater than 95% chance of being alive in five years. You're cured. You get it here, you've got less than 5%. So 95% of these people will be dead in five years. 95% of these guys will be alive in five years. Get it early and you'll live. So what am I on about today? That's where these screening tests come in. Because another very important point, polyps and early stages of cancer bleed. Right? Now this is not a bucket full of blood. Right? This is microscopic bleeding. You don't see it. It's not. But it's there. This bleeding occurs well before any symptoms are ever noticed. And that is the basis of these faecal occult blood tests. They will pick that blood and they will pick the cancer very early. Everyone with me on that? The NHMRC says everyone, or recommends, that everyone over the age of 50 should have a screening test at least every two years. Don't know how many guys or ladies here who are over 50. I'm certainly not going to make a guess. Uh, how many of you guys have had a faecal screening test for colorectal cancer? If, excellent. Oh, there you go. Look, I'm treat the converted. Anyone who didn't put their hand up, mate, mate, you know, um, let's think about it. Uh, what happens? It's very easy. People have done it. It's, it can be done at home. It's simply placing a small amount of faeces on a, on a strip and you post it back to the pathologist. That's a strip. This is the, um, the people that have been promoting the test here are um, clinical genomics and bowel screen and the colo vantage is the, the test. 
Um, and all you do is you put sample there, and you can one day, sample there the other day, you close the flaps, you put it in the mail, and you, you send it off. It's a very simple test. There are variations on the theme here, and in the interests um, of time, I won't go through in detail these tests, but they're all trying to detect this blood, okay? And some have advantages over others. There's a thing called, and if you don't know how to pronounce this, it's guaiac. Um, funny way of spelling things, but guaiac. It's a chemical, and it detects heme in the faeces. Now, heme is the iron-carrying component of hemoglobin. You, the homework is, people, when you're on the plane or you're home tonight, get the iPhone or whatever, Google the hemoglobin molecule, right? And you'll see heme sits in the middle of it. Um, and that's what is detected by this test. This one uses three separate bowel motions. As you could see in the other one, there were two, which I'll come back to. All that is, is it's just increasing your odds of getting the blood, right? If it's not bleeding the first day, it's probably going to bleed the second day. So it's just a little bit of an insurance policy. There is the potential <coughs> for false positives. And when, if you're going to counsel patients about this test, this, this is worth um, just spending a couple of minutes on, particularly if you're using this GWIAC test. Because it doesn't pick hemoglobin, it picks heme. That is the middle molecule of hemoglobin. And it will pick it no matter where it's come from. To use an extreme, if you're using this test and you have eaten a rare steak the last couple of days, it will pick the blood. If you've been and had dental procedures and you've swallowed blood, it will pick it. If you have taken uh, medicines, NSAIDs or something, aspirin that might have caused a little bit of bleeding, it will pick it. Because what it does is, the blood up here in the upper gut, haemoglobin, all the acid and enzymes break it down quickly, but they don't break down the heme, right? So the heme just travels through the gut into the bowel and the test will pick it, right? It's not, so it's just a, not a potential, well, it's a problem or that we need to know of. So if you want to use this test, you do have to look at the diet and you do have to look at medications two or three days before that test is used. If you look at, oh, here we go. If you look at the, the faecal immunochemical tests, and this is one, the one that's been promoted here at the stand, the major difference is these guys have antibodies to haemoglobin, right? So if it's not haemoglobin, they won't pick it. it. It just won't be detected. I'll come back to that. This, this is two separate bowel motions, day A, day B. Potential for false positives and required dietary changes is much, much less. You don't, it doesn't matter if you eat a steak before this test. It doesn't matter if someone's pulled half your head off of the dentist, right, and you've bled and done it, because the haemoglobin will be broken down by the acid, the enzymes in the stomach and duodenum. Everyone with me on that? So it's gone. But the heme is still there. So if you're looking at heme, you'll pick it. If you're looking at haemoglobin, you won't. So if this test comes up positive, the blood has come from the lower bowel, the colon and the rectum. Everyone with me on that? So that it's just travelled through that area. I didn't, um, so you don't need to worry about dietary or medication changes with this one. I didn't mention this on the other one, and I should have, because both are there. It's there just as a precautionary thing. The idea is you don't do the test, leave it out in the sun for a week, and then get round to posting it off. Okay, so you do it, post it, and everything's fine. But if you wait a couple of weeks and it's been sitting on the windowsill with the sun coming in, the test ain't going to work all that well. So what if you do this test and you come positive? Then you should have a colonoscopy. Now a colonoscopy, I'm sure many people in the room have had one, I've had one, is where a tube's inserted in, um, into the rectum and, and colon and there's a, there's a camera on it. You can see polyps. You can chop them off, get rid of them. You can see cancers. So if it is positive, 
a colonoscopy is where you're going. Um, there can be <clears throat> the one thing I haven't mentioned yet because I wanted to leave it. Again, if we're counselling patients to use this, if someone has haemorrhoids at the time, piles, and they're playing up or whatever, they're likely to bleed, be bleeding. It'll pick it, right? So don't do the test if someone has troublesome haemorrhoids, etc., at the time. There may be false negatives. That is, you could have a problem that doesn't pick it up because they don't bleed all the time, but I'll come back to that. So a negative test, to be absolutely uh, fair, does not always mean the colorectal cancer is not present. It's, it's, the vast majority of times it does, but in some instances it doesn't. This is another message I'm getting, and this is why the NHMR, I'm going to give you NHMRC saying this, test every 12 to 18 months. And the next couple of slides, colorectal cancers grow slowly. Right, so time is on your side if you keep doing the tests. From the first time, if I was to grow a polyp now, starting to grow a polyp, little thing, you can visualise it just popping out of my rectum or colon there, jumping out. It's going to be 10 years before that becomes cancer. Right, a long time. And then it's going to be a slow, it's not an aggressive cancer like that. It's a slow growing one. So the point is, this test, this one that I've been asked to talk about, will pick 80% of cancers first up. In 18 months time, it'll pick some others up. And in, so after two or three times, you've virtually got them, right? It's, and time is still on your side because it's slowly growing. The reason why, and this is the thing we need to be saying is, you don't just do it once, you've got to do it continually over a period of time. We've all seen the National Bowel Cancer Screening Program. I got one in the mail once, that proves I'm over 50. Uh, <laughs> um, this is an excellent initiative, but the problem is, it only, it only gets a 35% hit rate. So in other words, for every 100,000 kits that are mailed out, 65,000 don't result in a test, right? 35,000 is pretty good, but it's not a big hit rate. And it's only sent at varying age groups. It is going to be increased a little bit down the track, but at this point, it's only sent to certain people and um, it's not that well uh, followed up. You've seen these, and I just put this up for uh, information, clinical genomics have the bowel screen, bowel transfer Australia. This is, a, this is the FIT test, fecal immunochemical test. Bowel scan, and I'm sure everyone is aware of the, uh, the rotary promotion through pharmacy. They tended to use a GUIAC test, but things do vary. But we're, we're familiar with these things. So there is noise out there about bowel cancer screening, and I'm sure everyone has some kits, or most have them in the pharmacy. Let's look at this. Then this, this is, so that's the background. Now I just want to try and put this in, um, in perspective. NH and MRC recommends that people over the age of 50 have a screening test every two years. The vast majority of people over 50 in this country today are not being tested, right? It's just not happening. I think this is a, very, a great professional opportunity for pharmacy. I think it's a commercial opportunity for pharmacy. And I think pharmacy, these are my words, pharmacy can drive and be at the forefront of colorectal cancer screening, a major public health initiative. Now, to, to use um, this kit as an example, um, I just did some thought I'd do some mathematics or, or some finance. This is not a major bur financial burden to the consumer. Pathology and everything is under 40 bucks. Now I'm sure some of you have been in bars over in Jupiter's, a couple of drinks and the tip is 40 bucks, right? But this 40 bucks can save your life, right? Um, and you also there is health care and, Medi uh, and Medicare rebates on this. It's not a major financial burden. 
There's some just to show you the economics of it because pharmacy does have to survive and in these days it's a little bit more difficult than it was previously. It's 26 bucks to the pharmacy, 39.95 to the patient, 13.95 profit to the pharmacy. Now that doesn't, mightn't sound like a bucket full of money, but according to the statistics, there are over 7 million people in Australia over the age of 50. 7 million. It's recommended that each of these guys be screened every two years for colorectal cancer. I did the maths. If you could convince every one of these people, and I mean I think that's an unrealistic expectation, but if you can convince every one of these people to have a test every eight, 18 months or so, that, and this is not, not just um, sales, this is profit. You've got 100 million bucks coming into pharmacy. And that's a serious amount of money, right? Particularly in this thing. Major public health initiative, major financial return. It's a good professional opportunity for pharmacy. It's a good commercial opportunity for pharmacy. As I've said, counselling, informing people of the need to do this, how the test is done, simple, it's not expensive, and I'm saying pharmacy can grab the ball and run with this. You've seen the publicity, and I don't intend to spend a lot of time on it, but these are available in the pharmacy. I'm not too sure who came up with don't be a fool, test your stool, but you know, <laughs> it's catchy. <laughs> so I want everyone here to have one of these up in your pharmacies, right? Um, and there are other promotions. And this, this is good. I mean, it hits everyone. This is sort of saying a relative of mine died of colorectal cancer. And it's an unnecessary death. It really is. Um, Promotional kits, etc. I, I, not particularly my job to go through this in detail, but there are campaigns. There is going to be more noise out in the community, and people will be driven, for want of a better word, into your pharmacies to talk about this, and and you can counsel. February, don't be a fool. Campaign, Rotary, Bowel Awareness Month, September, etc. So none of these are fighting against one another, they're all complementary. But the problem with these guys is, if there is a problem, you don't just get bowel cancer in February, right? You don't just get bowel cancer in June. This should be sold every day in pharmacies. It should be just an ongoing screening process. Picking people up, you're over 50, do you realise it's this? Get it done. You will save lives. There's no debate on that. So what are the take-home messages? This thing is a highly prevalent and important health issue. It's the second most common killer of Australians when it comes to cancer. Early detection is essential. You get it early, you're cured. You get it late, you're dead. That, that's basically, there are exceptions, but that's basically the bottom line. Majority of Australians are not getting screened at the present time. Patient counselling, pharmacist counselling can really do a lot to reverse that situation. It's not only professional, it's commercial. It's a major public health initiative that can be driven by pharmacy, out of the pharmacies. Why die of a cancer with which if it detected early is curable. That's not a smart thing to do. Females regularly have screening mammograms for breast cancer. Everyone happy about that? It's top of mind. Females, God bless you, regularly have screening pap smears for cervical cancer. No argument? Everyone happy about that? Males regularly have digital rectal examinations and PSA for static specific antigen tests for prostate cancer. It's just part of the psyche. It happens. Colorectal cancer kills far more people than these guys. 
Why isn't that on the top of the list? Right? People over 50 should be encouraged to have regular, at least every two years, screening tests for colorectal cancer. Major public initiative. It's a good news story. I mean, there's no argument against it. it it's just there. And pharmacy can play a major role. Now, you don't have to go to the GP for this. You don't. Here, there's not a lot of ladies who do their own mammograms at home, right? Or have a pap smear. Not a lot of gentlemen do their own PSA tests at home, right? Or digital examinations. This you do at home. Simple. Literally a piece of cake to do. And it can save lives. So pharmacy can, and I'm repeating myself, be a major player in helping to reduce this disease and it can be a major player professionally and to help people um, from a financial uh, point of view. And I think that's it, so thank you for listening. Questions? Does anyone have any questions? Someone must have a question. Do you have a question over there, Megan? Sorry, where, Kelly? Just this gentleman here. Yes, sir. Hi, Professor Carroll. Um, my name's Nathan. I'm from a small pharmacy in uh, South Australia. Um, my maternal grandparents, my maternal grandfather died of bowel cancer. My, my grandmother had her bowel removed. Right. Um, you didn't mention anything, you mentioned age, you didn't mention anything about family history. Well, yeah, just at the start I did. Um, I think you might oh, have... I came, came in late. late. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That'll teach you. <laughs> We're going to now victimise you. We're gonna... <laughs> Everyone have a look at this guy. He's... <laughs> he snuck in late. Um, the answer is, for the majority of people, there is a slight family history. But most people with bowel cancer, you can't really do it. I mentioned polyps, and in the extreme from a genetic thing, there is familial polypiposis. I think that polyposis. That is some people do grow a whole lot of polyps. It's just a genetic, the way they are. And these people, it, that tends to have a family history associated with it. And those people are more likely to get bowel or colorectal cancer, right? It's because they are growing a bucket full of polyps. Okay, now I don't know whether that genetic trait is within your family, but I would definitely be saying to you, and I'm sure as an intelligent person, even though you get here a bit late, you're, uh, <laughs> you're on top of this, I would be having colonoscopies. <laughs> Pretty good, eh? Um, so, I mean, you, you have to work out what you do with your own health. But I think with that type of family history with your mum and, and others, I'd be having regular colonoscopies because the polyps are there. You just chop them out. Are you happy with that? Hello, Peter. Andrew Top. Andrew, how are um, you doing? Very well. The rotary bowel scan, or whatever they're called now, $10 with no margin to us, but, it, but you sort of suggest that it might be a lesser quality test. Can you sort of expand yeah, on that? Because yeah, we've got to sell the price difference, basically. Well, I, th I think the Rotary One is excellent because it, it, it's a public health initiative. It, it helps Rotary and it ticks all the boxes. I don't know what tests, in fact, others may be able to answer it in the room at this point, but they were at one point using the Guyant test. It's a hell of a lot better than nothing, right? And it's a good for pharmacy to support Rotary. And I'm not suggesting you throw all that out. What I'm saying is you put on top of it a serious campaign in your pharmacy to say, I'm going to get everyone that comes in over 50 to be tested, but I'm not going to wait for September or whatever. I'm going to have that message. I've got a thing in the pharmacy that says, talk to the pharmacist, etc. And that's all I can say. Um, but traditionally, they have, um, it has been the GUIAC test. Okay. Uh, We might... Um, There's one quick... Oh, hold it. We're yeah. probably running out of time. We are, yes. Um, but is there, there a very quick one? The stand afterwards. So there is the clinical 
genomics, the bow screen scan downstairs in the trade display, which is open till three today. Uh, so, um, and, and, yeah, and before you go, anyone who hasn't, I've lost my test. On the floor. <laughs> Bloody <laughs> hell. Anyone who's over the age of 50 or 40, if they think got risk, has not done it, go down to clinical genomics. I'll give you one. It won't cost you anything. Do it. And in three years' time, you might say, Pete, thank God I came to your lecture. <laughs> you know? Do it. Because everyone thinks these things happen to someone else, but to the rest of the world, you are someone else. Okay? So do it. Thank you.